Today's book is The English Verb by Michael Lewis. This is another book that I've actually read before. I read this three years ago. I'm rereading it for the book club uh, we've got at work, uh, Book Club for Professional Development. Uh, so this is, this is a book for professional development, probably the title told you that right away, The English Verb. Um, but it's an interesting book, and in fact, the last book we had read, uh, regular viewers uh, might remember, was Sound Foundations by Adrian Underhill. Sound Foundations, as I said in my review, is a very useful book, but a somewhat boring book to read cover to cover. And in the book club, we, will f we were feeling a little bit exhausted. And so I said, okay, let, let's read something really interesting. And I said, the English verb by Michael Lewis is really interesting. So we, we did this as kind of a treat uh, to reward ourselves for making it through Sound Foundations. Um, now, some people don't think a book with the title, The English Verb, would be interesting. And indeed, I think you have to be, you have to be into this profession a little bit before this kind of thing becomes interesting to you. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, you know, when I was a university student or whatever, I would, I would never have thought a book called The English Verb would have been interesting. But once you've been teaching English, you, I think you can't help but get interested in this stuff to a certain extent. Um, because it's interesting. One of the things you discover when you teach English is all the things that you do without even thinking about it uh, that are a source of confusion to people who don't speak English or who are learning English. Uh, so for example, will and going to. Uh, like I will go to the store, I'm going to go to the store. A native speaker never thinks at all about what the difference between will and going to is. Uh, I, I never thought about it myself for years. And I had even studied some grammar uh, as a student. I, I went to uh, an, a traditional American education. I think in American schools we still study grammar more than they do in kind of British or Australian schools. Um, and I was an English minor in university. Uh, now English, English in like the American universities is like a literature degree essentially, but there were because I was doing English education especially, I was a secondary education, uh, I had to take some grammar courses at university. So like I consider myself kind of more grammatically, grammatic, uh, ironic that I would mess up that sentence. Uh, I, I consider myself more grammar knowledge than the average person. Ah, oh, that wasn't right either. Okay, um, these, this is a classic example of uh, Chomsky's competence versus performance. Uh, anyways, um, but like even with all that background, I never thought about the difference between will, <clears throat> will and going to. It was never brought up in any of my grammar classes at university or my, um, you know, secondary school. Excuse me. Uh, because that education had kind of mostly focused on what was in, of interest to native speakers, which was kind of labeling things. Uh, and also, uh, to the extent that prescriptivism is a thing back in the United States in secondary schools, and it is kind of, it's, it's focusing on the types of mistakes that native speakers are like, likely to make mistakes in quotation marks if you're a descriptivist. Um, and the kind of the nuts and bolts of the language, uh, like why we use a present perfect verb tense instead of a past simple verb tense, or why we use will instead of going to, I don't remember that ever getting much attention uh, in, my, in my scholastic career because, you know, a native speaker wouldn't even need it. Um, but I, you know, I, the first time somebody brought this to my attention, I remember I was at a job interview in Japan, and he said, he was talking about grammar, and I said, yeah, I've got a strong grammar background. And he said, well, what's the difference between will and going to? And I had no idea. Uh, you know, you can, uh, in Japan especially, 
the ESL scene in Japan, you can get away with not knowing any grammar and still doing these kind of English teaching jobs. Um, you'll be happy to know that since that time, uh, I've, I've uh, acquired more knowledge. I've been working on a number of jobs now where I am kind of required to teach these things to the students. So I did what a number of ESL teachers do, is I kind of got my information from the textbooks I was teaching out of. Uh, now, of course, like a, as a native speaker, kind of subconsciously, uh, I've got, you know, my language faculty knows the difference, but, you know, the conscious explicit rules. Um, and if you get into this, there's all these different distinctions that the textbooks makes between will and going to. Uh, the most common one is going to is used for planned action. Will is used for a spontaneous action at the moment of speech. For example, we'd say, I'm going to the beach next Saturday. Like, I've already planned it. Uh, or, like, the phone's ringing. Bring, bring, and you say, I'll get it. Uh, you know, spontaneous decision made right at the moment of speech. Um, but then there are all these kind of weird, like, other things. Like, uh, we say, like, it's going to rain tomorrow if it's based on evidence. And we say, like, it will rain tomorrow if it's based on uh, prediction uh, without evidence. And, like, the, the, the grammar textbooks that are used in ESL classes have all these lists. And it's interesting to consider, one of the things you discover when you teach English is all the things that your brain does subconsciously, like... Nobody ever t teaches a native speaker what the difference between will and going to is. But subconsciously, they, they use them flawlessly all the time. Um, and, you know, where does that knowledge come from? Um, having raised that question, that's, that's somewhat outside the scope of this review, uh, outside the scope of this book. But anyways, that's, I guess that's kind of the reason I'm you get interest in this stuff after you teach English. It's just like, what exactly do these verb tenses mean? Like, how much do I know in my subconscious that I don't even know? It's kind of interesting when you get into this, uh, which is a long way of saying, this stuff can be interesting once you get into it. I know, I know it doesn't sound like the book called The English Verb can be interesting, but it can be interesting. Now, added to that, added to kind of the intrinsic interest in the material, if you're in ESL, uh, the author Michael Lewis has very strong opinions. Uh, he's a polemical author. He thinks certain people are teaching all wrong, and he is here to completely change it and, and say what's going on. So, it's, it's interesting reading somebody with strong opinions. Um, so there are, there are a number of strong opinions in this book that are interesting to read. Um, the major themes, Michael Lewis is of the opinion that the textbooks, the ESL textbooks that we teach out of, are kind of teaching everything all wrong by making categories out of the different uses. So I've already mentioned kind of willing going to. Another classic example is the present perfect. Uh, now this is another thing that as a native speaker I never thought about until I had to teach it. But the way it's taught in ESL textbooks is there's about like five different uses of the present perfect. You use it to say an action that started in the past and still is ongoing. So for example, I've lived in Vietnam for two years. Started in the past, still continuing now. You use it for a past action with a present result. For example, I just came in from the rain. No, that's not present perfect. I've just come in from the rain. That's why I'm all wet. Uh, you use it for something that just happened recently. I've just finished my homework now. Uh, you use it for uh, uh, an experience at an indefinite point in the past, like I've been to Japan. You don't say when, but it's an experience you've had at some point in the past. And did I say five? I don't remember what the other one is. Anyways, that, that's how the textbooks present them, as kind of a list of separate meanings. Uh, and Michael Lewis says, no, 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 this is just totally confusing the students, making a mess out of it. He says, each verb tense has one meaning, uh, one unifying meaning, and all these other meanings are just examples of that one meaning, that, like different manifestations and context of that meaning. 
So all the present perfect, all the usages have to do with your looking back at a past event from the perspective of the present. So kind of your, your viewing the event in the past from how it affects the present now. Uh, every, all those other events can be explained by the present perfect. All those other uses are explained by that definition. Um, same with kind of like will and go, well, same with all the tenses. Um, so that's, that's one thing that he feels very strongly about. Uh, and he kind of feels that all the tenses kind of viewed through this have kind of one unifying meaning. Uh, and you don't need to make kind of different lists of when they occur. Um, there's a couple other things he feels strongly about. Uh, he is of the opinion that the present tense, what we call the present tense, and what we call the, sorry, the present simple and the past simple, really have nothing to do with time. Uh, they just deal with immediacy and remoteness. If we feel the event is immediate to us, we use the present simple, the so-called present simple. If we feel the event is remote from us, we use the so-called past simple. Uh, and again, the, the Michael Lewis thinks the names are wrong. A present symbol doesn't have to do with the present. Past symbol doesn't have to do with the past. And he, he, he has some examples here. Um, present simple we use for all sorts of purposes that have nothing to do with the past. Sorry, with the present. We, uh, we use it for the future, like the train leaves at 4 p.m. tomorrow. We use the present simple to narrate past events at times, especially when like these events feel very kind of vivid to us. Um, and in the same way, the past simple can be used to describe hypothetical futures, like uh, if I don't know, if I were a bird, I would fly. Uh, you know, the past war and would there. It's also used to describe kind of remote remoteness. Uh, so for example, could you pass the salt? You'd say, could you instead of can you? Not because you're asking about somebody's ability in the past, but just because there's like a social distance there. So you, you use a remote form. Um, and he, he, makes, he makes an interesting case for this. Uh, and apparently he quotes from a few other people. He's not the first person to have thought of this. Uh, there are other grammarians who argue that the present simple and the past simple just have to do with kind of how psychologically remote we kind of feel the event. Um, but it's interesting. Uh, I mentioned I read this book three years ago. Since I've read it three years ago, I've kind of picked up on some other books that have disagreed with him. For example, Scott Thornberry uh, in his book about language implies disagreement with this. Scott Thornberry mentions that there's a lot of, that there are some grammarians out there who feel that the present simple and the past simple have to do with kind of immediateness or remoteness. But he says, if you look at how these verbs are used, their primary meaning is time. Uh, the primary use of the past simple is to describe something in the past. All the other uses where it's used to describe something remote are kind of secondary meanings of that. Of course, Michael Lewis doesn't like that, wouldn't like that, because uh, he says all the verb tenses kind of have one unifying meaning. Another thing that's interesting about this book is the idea that he talks about grammar as a choice instead of grammar as a fact. For example, kind of will going to, sorry, will and going to again. Now again, the textbooks that teachers teach out of will categorize these. You use going to in this situation, you use will in this situation. Uh, and then students, if, you, if you're a teacher, you're familiar with this. Students have to do these scat fill exercises where they read a sentence and there's uh, the modal is missing and they have to write either the will form or the going to form to practice this. Quite often this will show up in tests. I've certainly taught at schools where students have been tested on this. So Michael Lewis says, you can't, you can't do these exercises, you can't do these tests, because the difference between will and going to has nothing to do with the external circumstances. Uh, 
It's how the speaker psychologically views the event. So for example, going to, Michael Lewis says we use going to when we feel like we have kind of accumulating evidence for an event. And he includes in this definition internal evidence. So like I'm going to the shop tomorrow, my internal evidence is the fact that I've made plans. Uh, I'm going to sneeze, I can feel the tickling in my nose, this internal evidence. It's going to rain tomorrow, I can see the clouds, I've got, it, got, I got like accumulating evidence. Where we use will, yeah. will's a bit cumbersome, or uh, his definition of will is a bit tricky. We use will when we feel some sort of imminent connection between the present state and another state. And again, he says it's not temporal because we can use will, we can use will in a sentence like they, they will be there by now, like in the present tense. Uh, but that's connecting like one situation in the present with another situation in the present. Uh, but it's most often used in the future. Like it will rain tomorrow means you feel like there's an imminent connection between this event as I see it now and some sort of future event and you feel like they're psychologically connected. So what the speaker feels when he says a sentence, whether they feel like there's an accumulation of knowledge or whether they feel like there's some sort of uh, imminent uh, psychological connection between the two different states is up to the speaker. So you can't devise these grammar exercises where you say like going to or will because like they're both correct. You know, like one person would feel like there's accumulating knowledge. One person might feel like they feel like it's psychologically imminent. Um, I, either one would be correct. Now what's interesting about this view to me when I was reading this book is that implies that every time I speak and I say going to or will, I'm, without even realizing it, I'm subconsciously revealing how I subconsciously view the world uh, without, even, without even realizing what I'm saying. Uh, if I say like, I'll go to the park tomorrow or I'm going to the park tomorrow, uh, I've somehow just revealed to the listener that either I view this event as accumulation of evidence or I view this as kind of psychologically inevitable given the present state of affairs. Um, and I thought, boy, that's interesting, isn't it? Like, I, didn't, I don't even know the difference between will and going to, or I didn't for years. And then every time I say it, I'm revealing something about my subconscious state of mind and how I view the inevitability of the event. Um, and again, it gets the kind of, the consistency with which language is used or which Michael Lewis claims that it's used is interesting and it makes you think about kind of how language is stored in the native speaker's brain. How, how does a native speaker acquire this knowledge to begin with? You know, the knowledge that we don't even, can't even articulate, but that is being used in a consistent way. I mean, it's just fascinating to consider this. And Michael Lewis doesn't go into any of these questions. Um, but it, it, you know, I think it, Chomsky would be very interested in these questions. Chomsky has been very interested in these questions. Um, but there's a caveat here, which is, again, not everyone agrees with Michael Lewis. Another book I have here, uh, Grammar for English Language Teachers by Martin Parrott. Um, he says something interesting here about the difference between will and going to. Namely, that actually there's not such a big difference um, and he, he goes through the language data, the corpus data, to kind of pick out ex real examples of language use, which Michael Lewis doesn't do. Michael Lewis is kind of entirely reliant on his native speaker intuition, kind of making up his own examples. But Perot goes through the data, and it turns out that native speakers will alternate between will and going to just for stylistic reasons. Uh, native speakers do not like repeating the same word too many times. Particularly, this seems to be an issue with going to, am going to. Uh, and you can imagine why. I guess it's kind of a longer word, it's kind of cumbersome to repeat so many times. 
So Peru has examples here where a native speaker will use am going to at the, you know, for the first thing. And then most of the subsequent examples will be, um, will use will. So for example, he quotes an example of a, of a child speaking where the child says, I'm going to go swimming tomorrow and then I'll go to the beach and then I'll go to get an ice cream or something like that. I'm paraphrasing from memory, but it's something like that. The first one is going to. All the rest of them are will. But th now they're all future plans. These are all he's all talking about his plans for tomorrow. But the uh, stylistically, the native speakers don't like using going to in every single sentence. So we will use will there. Uh, and then he also suggests that there's all sorts of other things going on. Different people have different preferences. There's formal versus informal writing. Also, in a subordinate clause, we use will instead of going to. Uh, so, for example, I'd say, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, if, when I, I don't know. Sorry, I can't think of an example. But I'd say, when I'll get there. Uh, not when I'm going to get there. Because it's in a subordinate clause. So, I, they, you use will. Um, and so all that kind of made me think, yeah, actually, maybe, maybe actually my language faculty isn't quite as fine-tuned as Michael Lewis thinks it is. Like, maybe my brain doesn't kind of perfectly understand the difference between will and going to and all these kind of psychological nuances that, you know, Michael Lewis thinks my brain is doing all the time. Um, now, to be perfectly fair to Michael Lewis, a couple times in the book, he qualifies what he's saying by making some sort of remark like, now, of course, I'm not saying that language is totally consistent. I'm saying that there are broad generalities that can be pointed to. So I don't know, like maybe this isn't a direct contradiction to Michael Lewis. Maybe if Michael Lewis was confronted with this, he'd say, yeah, 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 those, you know, but in general, it's very consistent. I don't know. Um, it, it's, um, the impression you get reading Michael Lewis is that your subconscious is very consistent with these uses of verb tenses. Uh, the impression I got here is that we just kind of mix and match a lot for kind of no apparent reason. Well, for stylistic reasons. Uh, either way, whether kind of we're using will and going to totally consistently, like Michael Lewis thinks, or whether we're changing back and forth for stylistic reasons, like Martin Parrott thinks. Uh, either way, uh, either way, the, the ESL textbooks that we're using, uh, which kind of posit all these lists of rules for when to use will and when to use going to, I, either way, those textbooks are just kind of, either theory would discredit the ESL textbooks. Um, so, you know, like, uh, if, if you're looking for something to complain about in the staff room, like, ah, oh, these textbooks, they're always getting stuff wrong. Yeah, you can complain about them from the perspective of either theory. Um, so, a couple more things in this book. Uh, he, uh, the present continuous. Uh, present continuous is often taught as something which is happening right now, like, I am talking now, present continuous. Um, Michael Lewis doesn't agree with that definition. Uh, he says the present continuous is when we want to emphasize the limited duration of something. So, for example, I am talking now means I am talking for like a limited duration, 30 minutes or however long this video ends up being, uh, at which point I will stop talking and I wasn't talking before that point. Um, and that is why, according to Michael Lewis, we often don't put state verbs in the present continuous. So verbs like have or know or think or live, we don't usually put in the present continuous. We don't say, I am having a dog. Uh, Michael Lewis would say that's because the present continuous isn't so much about what's happening right now. It's something of limited duration that happens to overlap with the time period now. Uh, something of limited duration in the past would be the past continuous. Something of limited duration in the future would be the future uh, continuous. Um, where, yeah, whereas the present simple is kind of something we see as like a point in time or kind of something that's always true kind of outside of time. Um, he, yeah, lots of stuff in here. I mean, he goes 
kind of through all the modals, must, can, have to. Um, a point he makes a few different times in this book is uh, differences of form imply differences of meaning. So Michael Lewis does not like grammar books that say, oh, these two forms are the same. So for example, uh, have to and must. They're often taught as equivalent forms. Uh, like, uh, I have to do my homework, I must do my homework. Uh, ESL textbooks, we usually teach them as equivalents. And in fact, us teachers, when we're trying to explain it, we'll explain one by reference to the other. Like, uh, I must do my homework, it means I have to do my homework. Or I have to do my homework, it means I must do my homework. Um, and Michael Lewis says, if they're different forms, they have different meanings. And he says, if they didn't have different meanings, then we wouldn't have different forms for it. He, so, he uh, says like the, the language would not have evolved two different forms with exactly the same meaning. I mean, why would it? It's just completely wasteful. So, have to and must have different meanings. And this is why uh, he gets into this. Uh, mustn't and don't have to have completely different meanings, right? Like, I mustn't do my homework and I don't have to do my homework. Say I don't have to do my homework, it means there's a choice. If you say I mustn't do my homework, it means there's no choice. Also, had to can be used in the past. I had to do my homework yesterday. There's no past form of must, at, at least with the form of obligation. Uh, with certainty, like, ah, it must have been, must have been a big dinner yesterday. Uh, I don't know. Uh, that can go into the past. Um, so Michael Lewis says, okay, well, let's look at this. Let's look at where what have to can be used for and what must can be used for. And he, he comes up, he says they're, they're actually different. Uh, have to has some sort of like external necessity, uh, external obligation. Like I have to do my homework because, you know, it's, it's a rule. I'll get in trouble with the teacher. Whereas must is like the speaker perceives it as a necessity. Like I must do my homework because um, I, I, I want to learn. Um, and that's why uh, Michael Lewis says that the negative forms are different. And that's why he says must can't be used in the past because must is only used for something we perceive as a necessity now. Um, so like those kind of things are interesting. Um, it's one of, the, one of the results from this book uh, that I've carried with me from the first time I've read it. Because uh, lots of times, students will have a question. They'll say, oh, teacher, what's the difference between this and this? And I'll always say, oh, it's the same. No difference. Um, but no, after reading Michael Lewis, I'm always like, well, there must be a difference. Differences of form imply differences of meaning. And most of the time, I can't figure out what the difference is. Uh, and sometimes I wonder maybe if myself and Michael Lewis are being a little bit too dogmatic about this. Maybe sometimes they mean the same thing. Maybe sometimes there are two different forms of the same meaning. And in fact, actually, there's one example in the book. And I apologize, I cannot remember what this is. Uh, but somewhere in this book, Michael Lewis is talking about something. And he says... I know I usually say differences of form mean difference of, of meaning, but in this particular case, it looks to me like they mean exactly the same thing. I can't figure out what the difference is. I can't think of the example, but he, like, he, he admits at once that there's a, these two different forms that seem to have exactly the same meaning. Um, yeah, what else is in here? Oh, I've, I've, I've got one minute left. There's more to talk about, but I need a moment to collect my thoughts, and maybe this is just a good time to end the review. So, lots of interesting stuff in here. I didn't talk about all of it, but you can read the book for yourself.